100% sure exactly how we're going to do it, but we've created materials for an online section. And what we think we're going to do is we're going to pick a 10 or 20% simple random sample of you guys, and we'll offer you the opportunity to take the online section. Now, if you're already assigned to an in-person section, if you don't want to participate in the online section, you can do the in-person section instead. There's no risk or harm to you in any way. If you choose to do the online section, you can participate in the online section and also participate in the face-to-face -face section or not. So, um, so we'll send around instructions about how to do that. We haven't fully worked out how we're going to do it. We're trying to experiment with some pedagogic um, innovations, and this is an idea we have. You'll see more about it uh, when the time comes. Um, the, uh, the PDFs for the slides, as I said the last time, we'll be typically putting online every third or fourth, uh, fourth lecture. Okay. So last time we discussed a number of things. We talked a little bit about how life expectancy at birth has increased dramatically over the last hundred years or so. And this is part of a broader phenomenon known as the health transition that's been taking place in industrialized democracies throughout the world over the last, well, over the last 400 years, uh, but over different time frames in different countries. Part of this health transition has also involved a shift in the causes of death and in the nature of illnesses prevalent in the population. So it's not just that people are living longer, they're also suffering from different sorts of problems. And there's been a shift from acute infectious disease and nutritional deprivations to chronic, uh, sort of, uh, chronic diseases and mental disorders. In addition, last time we saw that there's been a compression of morbidity, so that no longer are we live, no, not only are we living longer uh, and dying of different things, but we're also healthier while we live. We also reviewed different ways of defining health, introducing the statistical, adaptive, and social ways, and also, uh, and also ways of measuring health, which we touched on towards the end. And finally, we considered the problem of medicalization, which we'll return to later in the course. And we noted the irony that as mortality has been decreasing, more and more seemingly and previously tangential features of human experience have been brought into the field of medicine and come to be considered a proper part of medical care. And, and a legitimate concern of doctors. And this also is an irony uh, that we noted, that may be part of the health transition. And for example, in the first class, we saw data like this. We looked at, across time, the leading killers in, uh, in 100 years ago. And we saw, as we saw, that uh, most of them were infectious, pneumonia and influenza, tuberculosis, diarrhea. Uh, and then we had heart disease, stroke, acute kidney infection is also on the list, uh, and then diphtheria. So these are all like five of the top 10 are infectious, and 100 years later, the list is completely different. Most of the infectious causes have completely fallen off the list, except pneumonia and influenza and acute kidney infection, and now heart disease, cancer, and stroke, and pulmonary disease are the leading killers. Um, and the question is, or sort of the broad issue is, can we understand how and why this has been happening? Does it, in fact, have something to do with modern medical care? Does this shift in causes of death, can it be ascribed to the invention of modern medicines and to the development of modern uh, medical interventions of the kind you all are so familiar with. And are these diseases declining for a reason? And what is that reason? Now, certainly, there have been extremely impressive advances in medicine over the last 100 years. So even a cursory look, even from your own memories, if you just construct or remember things that doctors and, and researchers have invented over the last 100 years, you could produce a list like this. So aspirin is sort of discovered. It, it had been known in the past that sort of certain kinds of medicinals could have, these per, uh, could have this function, but aspirin was eventually isolated and understood as a sort of a pharmacologic agent over 100 years ago. Blood transfusion is over 100 years old. The EKG is over 100 years old. Insulin was invented nearly 100 years ago. Prior to the discovery of insulin, diabetes was uniformly fatal. If you were diagnosed, and many of you probably have diabetes, or some of you, uh, if you had been diagnosed with this condition over 100 years ago, that was it, pretty much. And needless to say, insulin, the discovery of insulin, and eventually its deployment for therapeutic purposes, was a radical uh, change in the treatment of this condition. In what is one of the most salient advances in modern medicine, and as a kind of benchmark we'll be returning to, beginning in the 1930s, you have the discovery of antibiotics. First the sulfonamide antibiotics, and then eventually the penicillin antibiotics in the late 1930s and late 1940s, are very effective at treating a diverse set of infectious diseases. 1952 sees polio vaccination, and eventually, basically, the, the complete eradication of polio from our society. If you talk to your grandparents, 
Many of them will remember when they were your age or younger, polio epidemics that would sweep through communities and, and kill uh, children and, and or make them paralyzed. Uh, 1953, we see elucidation of the structure of DNA. 1950s, we see the invention of oral contraceptives. Beginning in 1960s, initially at Harvard, well, not just at Harvard Medical School, but other universities around the country, organ transplantation uh, is invented. People, uh, many of you have relatives that have received organs, uh, in tra uh, transplanted organs. All of that in the last 50 years. 1974, we have the invention of CT scanners. In the 1990s, of course, the invention of a variety of antiretroviral, anti-HIV medications. And all of these had a very substantial life-saving effect on individual recipients and no doubt improve the health of the population. And it's reasonable to ask, in fact, whether the discovery of antibiotics around the time of World War II had something to do with the decline of infectious diseases that we just saw. So 100 years ago, no antibiotics, many infectious killers. 100 years later, many antibiotics, very few infectious killers. It's a very reasonable question to ask whether the discovery and ultimately the, the, the proliferation of antibiotics might have something to do with this change in the leading killers. And there's no doubt that medical care has certainly changed. You can even get a sense of this just by looking at pictures of hospitals. So if you go back 100 years ago and look at a typical hospital, this is what it looked like. This is a hospital 100 years ago. Uh, and if you go forward about 42 years, this is what it looked like. All of a sudden, there's a bowl of soup appears. Uh, there's a woman with a little uh, a hat. But otherwise, there's really been no change uh, in 50 years in the appearance uh, of a hospital. Uh, here's another eight years later. Now we begin to have a little high technology. There's some ropes and uh, you know, some other devices that could be used for traction. Uh, this is still the state of affairs. Uh, here we could have a lot of, you know, little pets uh, could be brought to this little girl. Uh, this was you know, cutting edge uh, treatment. Actually, this is still cutting edge treatment uh, for this young girl uh, suffering probably from, uh, from polio. Actually, I don't know what her uh, condition is. Uh, and here's what it looks like in the year 2000. Right? Just visually, you can see the kind of, the kind of incredible uh, inroads of technology into the medical care that is provided uh, to uh, our people in our hospitals. In fact, so much so, these changes are so dramatic that for some patients, a kind of guide is required. Here's a brochure that was put out by the Society for Critical Care Medicine in 2000. Uh, and the guide is, what will my loved one look like? So now that they've been uh, in, put into the grip of this medical infrastructure, there's the kind of implication that maybe their, their appearance will have been transformed by the application of this technology, so much so that you need a little booklet to figure out what's going on uh, with my loved one's uh, body. And so here are indexed all these lines, some of them uh, discreetly under a little tarp that's over the patient's waist, uh, a heart monitor leads, pulse oximeter, Foley catheters, those go into the urethra, uh, peripheral IVs, blood pressure cuffs, arterial lines, those are nasty, difficult to put in lines that go into people's arteries. Um, central lines are big, huge, like they're like this long, things that you thread into the main veins of the patient's body, uh, ventriculostomies, uh, endotracheal tubes, tracheostomy tubes, chest tubes, nasogastric tubes, dialysis catheters, intraortic balloon pump, that's like a little, uh, you thread that through the femoral artery up through the, to the patient's aorta, and it's a, a balloon that, that counter pumps with heartbeat so that when the heart is pressing, the balloon shrinks, lets blood go by, and when the heart is in diastole or relaxing, the balloon inflates and helps to augment the, uh, the forward velocity of the blood in the patient's uh, heart. Basically, any hole you have, and even some you don't, people will put, uh, <laughs> You know, put something in uh, in the hospital uh, when you go in nowadays, and you can be festooned with these kinds of lines to the point sometimes where, <laughs> where people confuse the lines in ways that are not so pleasant. We'll, we'll come back to that later on. Anyway, technology's advanced to the point where people and their loved ones truly need a manual if they're admitted to the hospital. And, um, and as I already noted, there's a suggestion in this pamphlet that the patient literally might be transformed in, uh, in, in their nature by the application of this sort of, of technology, rendered, in fact, unrecognizable by the healthcare uh, system. And in fact, there are doctors still alive. Actually, this is an interview I did with a doctor 20 years ago now, so he's, alas, not still alive, a very beloved, famous physician I talked to, who can testify to these types of changes. Here's what one doctor said. He said, when I was a young doctor in the 1940s, we were led to believe that certain diseases had certain courses, 
For instance, there was nothing we could do for individuals who had subacute bacterial endocarditis. That's when uh, ger uh, bacteria flow through the bloodstream and infect the lining of the heart. We were taught that you couldn't cure that and that the course of the disease was two or three months. You could be much more definitive in those days. We didn't have anything we could do for patients. For instance, Addison's disease due to tuberculosis, that's when the tuberculosis infects the adrenal glands. Addison's disease due to tuberculosis was, an was another one for which, we, for which there wasn't anything you could do. They all died. And roughly, we would divide leukemics up into acute leukemics and those with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And we knew the latter would live for a much longer period of time. We could give them a little radiation or something, whereas the acute leukemics would die. Most kids with leukemias, my early days, all died. We just began to get antibiotics when I was in school. Penicillin just came in about that time, what little became available. Before that, people who got pneumococcal meningitis, most of them died. But we didn't have much to do about it. We knew that if they had meningitis, well, it was a bad disease. I mean, people alive today remember the transformation in American medicine that took place, that transition from a period of time when most diseases just killed you to a situation in which most diseases there was something we could do about and many we could actually cure. So you might reasonably wonder whether, in fact, this is what helps explain the dramatic changes in causes of death and the increases in longevity that I've been describing for you the last couple of lectures. Because given these very real changes, changes to which many doctors actually experience and can give testament to, it would seem that medicine was a big part of the improvements in life expectancy over the last hundred years. In fact, here's an illustrative cartoon. Imagine we plot the number of people dying of a particular condition, say measles, so here's a population death rate, let's say, of measles on the y-axis and time since 1900 on the x-axis. Uh, and so this is the number of people dying from 100,000 of measles. And I'm going to ask you now, where do you think the effective treatment for measles that doctors invented was introduced? Was it a period of, was it a time point A, B, C, D, or E? When was the invention of measles-specific treatment uh, promulgated into medicine? So raise your hands if you think it was A. Come on, raise your hands. I don't know who you are. You can have nice anonymity. OK, B. Who thinks it was B? B is very popular. Uh -huh. C. These are all the practice SAT takers here. You guys know like you're all working the angles right now. Uh, <laughs> D and E. OK, so B is the most popular. We've got some votes for A, C, and D, and not so many uh, for E. Well, here's, where, here's the answer. It's like D or E. This is the population for the last 100 years. This is the population uh, mortality rate per 100,000 for measles. Here it is hopping around, declining, beginning in the 1920s or so. Pretty much has disappeared in the 1950s. And then all of a sudden, in the 19, uh, whatever it is, I can't see there, in the 80s, measles vaccination, which is the only effective treatment for measles really to speak of, was finally introduced. It would seem that actually this specific treatment for measles had little, if anything, to do actually with the disappearance of measles from our population. And this kind of analysis, which was first introduced by British medical historian Thomas McCune, uh, was first introduced by him. And it was very influential in stimulating people's thinking about this topic. Now, incidentally, let's say that measles mostly affects young people, which it does. Do you think that this decline here might be due simply to the increasing aging of our society, meaning that there was a decrease in available victims? Could some of this decline simply be an artifact of the fact that we're older now than we used to be. Do people understand my question? Do you think that the aging of the population might partly explain this decline in the, in the cases of measles, deaths of measles per 100,000? You should have the intuition that, that the answer to that is yes. If measles primarily kills the young, and let's say if we had 50 young out of 100 people, more people would die of measles in a population where 50% of the people are young, than a population where, let's say, only 10 are young out of 100 people. If measles primarily affects the young and the age structure of the population changes, maybe part of this decline is simply because people are getting older across time. That's why the case fatality, the uh, death rate from measles is declining across time. Do people understand that point? So to really make this claim that the measles mortality rate, mortality per 100,000, is declining across time, we also have to adjust for the changing age structure of the population. For instance, we have to take that into account. Now, even if you did that in the case of measles, uh, this, this, this pattern would still persist. Uh, you would see that the decline in measles 
was occurring many years in advance of the introduction of specific medical treatment for the condition. And this idea of adjusting for other factors is an idea we'll return to later today and also in subsequent uh, lectures. And again and again, we see exactly this pattern. If you look across diseases, so here's measles that I just showed you. Here's, uh, here's tuberculosis. The first effective treatment for tuberculosis was the invention of the drug isoniazide, uh, introduced over here in the 19, late 1950s. Already, tuberculosis was disappearing. Here's scarlet fever, the first effective treatment in the mid-1940s, penicillin. Already was almost gone when penicillin was invented. Ditto for typhoid. First effective treatment, the antibiotic chloramphenicol introduced subsequent to the discovery of penicillin, also occurs well after uh, typhoid has been declining in the population. And in fact, the general and by now obvious point is that, there is, that these declines were not, in fact, due to specific medical interventions, discoveries, or treatments. Uh, those were not, in fact, primarily responsible for the decline in mortality from all infectious diseases in the last century. So if it wasn't medical care, what was it? What could explain these declines if it's not medical care? Well, before that, let's consider one non-infectious illness. Here's scurvy. Scurvy results from a deficiency in vitamin C. And vitamin C is functionally most useful for collagen synthesis. Vitamin C does many things in our body. <coughs> but one of the important things that it's required for is for the synthesis of collagen. So when you lack vitamin C, collagen synthesis eventually is degraded. And when you lack collagen, you get a number of nasty symptoms of, uh, in collagen-containing tissues like the skin, cartilage, teeth, bones, and capillaries. So your teeth begin to fall out. You get bleeding in multiple organs, in mucous membranes, and in your skin. You get all these symptoms from this cascading failure from vitamin C uh, deficiency. And a person with this ailment looks pale, feels depressed, and typically is not very mobile. And scurvy was at one time very common among sailors who were at sea longer than perishable fruits or vegetables, which are the principal sources of vitamin C, could be stored. Uh, so the sailors would set to sea, they would eventually exhaust their vegetable supply, and they'd spend another year on the ship without any access to vitamin C and would develop this, this condition called scurvy um, at sea. And here is the case of measles plotted along the case of scurvy. So here on the purple, we see again the measles mortality rate per 100,000. Remember, we just saw that. And now in blue, here on the right hand axis, scurvy mortality rate plotted on the same exact axis. And you see both of them evince a very similar pattern uh, in their decline. And from this relationship between scurvy and measles, you could surmise that something else is going on in explaining the decline of uh, these conditions in human populations. That perhaps it has to do with general improvements in human well-being that must be at work, since measles treatments are not effective against scurvy, and scurvy treatments are not effective against measles. So perhaps, in fact, it had something to do with increasing public health awareness and a decline in poverty that were the main drivers of this type of decline in infectious diseases. So what really may explain the decline in infectious diseases, and actually, as I'll come to shortly, the overall improvements of health, is not specific medical treatments, but rather public health advances and socioeconomic change. For instance, the fact that we got richer over the last 100 years. Now, what do you think might have caused this bump in scurvy that's right here? Any thoughts on this, this bump? Yeah, World War II. So nutritional deficiencies associated with World War II. And what about this big spike here in, uh, in, uh, in measles? Yeah, World War I, the pandemic that actually, uh, the, the influenza pandemic that came right around that time. That's right. OK, now this pattern that we've been considering is not totally uniform. And certainly, in some conditions, yielded not just to socioeconomic change, but also to specific, to specific interventions. Here is more detail on the decline of pneumonia, a bacterial uh, infection of the lungs uh, that can be hard to distinguish from influenza, which is a viral infection of the lungs. So here, these were grouped together for the last 100 years. So a long time ago, they couldn't tell the difference. Now we can. But let's group them together. They're lung infections, uh, mostly bacterial, but also some viral. And here's the deaths per 100,000 across time. Uh, and you see, you know, for example, that just before the discovery of antibiotics, they're still high, but there's a dramatic decline right after the discovery of antibiotics in death rate from pneumonia. 
This decline, as I said, was already afoot, but there's no doubt that the discovery of sulfonamides and penicillin antibiotics did seem to have an effect. And if you read testimony of doctors, as I have, who were practicing medicine in the 1920s, you read them describe cases of people. There was one case I read by William Osler, who's a very famous physician at Johns Hopkins back then, who talked about a young woman your age, in her 20s, that was admitted with bacterial pneumonia to the hospital, and she died. And he gave a detailed description of her clinical course. It was instantly recognizable as pneumonia. They knew it was pneumonia. Her, her lungs were filling with pus and infection and fluids, and she died. And I read this case when I was uh, uh, a resident, or right after my residency. I was already a doctor. And it brought tears to my eyes, because I could walk into that patient's room today and lift my pinky and save her life just by putting in an IV and administering intravenous antibiotics. And she died in his care. So it's, it's a very dramatic difference that these conditions, that these antibiotics can make for certain kinds of infectious uh, diseases. But I actually would argue that in many ways, this success has cursed medicine ever since. Because penicillin turned a disease that was generally fatal into one that rarely was. And it was truly a miracle, the discovery of these types of antibiotics. But there has not been another penicillin. There has not been another medical discovery that had such a big effect size, that took a condition that was so prevalent and so fatal and made it not fatal, made the condition completely uh, survivable. And in fact, in some sense, penicillin has caused problems because it's been raising our expectations about the power of medicine to levels that are impossible to repeat. Because it was so amazing, penicillin, we keep waiting for the next penicillin-type discovery. Nevertheless, I think it must be acknowledged that this discovery around the Second World War was one that had a very discernible impact on population health. Now, we can get other sorts of data on the utility of medical care with respect to public health in other ways. So for example, as one of the readings for today, we could imagine an experiment in which we simply eliminated doctors from our society. So if you were trying to figure out, do doctors make a difference? Maybe we could do some kind of natural experiment where we took all the doctors and put them in prison and just removed them from society and said, well, what would happen to our society if we lacked physicians? Now, obviously, we can't do that, but there are some sort of natural experiments. For example, rare occasions in different parts of the world where doctors go on strike for different amounts of time and stop seeing uh, patients. And your readings provide data from five strikes by doctors between 1976 and 2003, lasting between nine days and 17 weeks. And the analysis showed that mortality either stayed the same or decreased while the doctors were on strike. So this large wholesale removal of physicians from the population seemed to have no discernible effect on whether people lived or died in these diverse countries uh, around the world. Not a single study of physician strikes has shown evidence for a rise in mortality during the period of the strike. And possible explanations for a decrease in mortality during strikes include perhaps a delay in elective surgeries. So for all those surgeries at the border that are not truly mandatory, if you push them forward, you defer them, you're also going to reduce some of the surgical mortality. Those people wouldn't die. They'll die later, and that may partially explain it. Or perhaps a decline in doctor-caused injuries Doctors often, in the course of their care, inadvertently kill patients. Uh, it's called iatrogenesis, and we'll come back to it. Maybe that also declines uh, during uh, the strikes. And here's a similar study that was just published two or three weeks ago that looked at what happens in the United States to patients with cardiac disease during the, uh, during the time twice a year when basically all the nation's cardiologists flock to one city. So all the cardiologists leave their, their home cities and go to wherever the, interna the National Cardiology Convention uh, is. So here on the y-axis is the adjusted 30-day mortality from conditions like heart attacks and heart failure in patients that had low predicted mortality. And again, heart attacks, heart failure, and the cessation in heart beating that had high predicted mortality. And here is if the patients happen to be admitted during the cardiac meeting or not or admitted uh, I'm sorry, not admitted during the meeting, or blue, if you happen to get one of these conditions and go to the hospital when most of the cardiologists are gone, or somewhere else. And they find actually that mortality is lower uh, when the cardiologists are on vacation, uh, when they're away. So in these conditions, yeah? 
that could really mean instead of just mortality, do they see like, for instance, to the patients, so for example, maybe the mortality is going uh, down, but suffering is going up, is that what you're asking? Yeah, I'm not familiar, most of these try to use hard endpoints uh, like that, so I don't know the answer to that question, that's a good question. So you could, in fact, this goes a little bit back to the last talk when we were talking about, well, what are different ways of measuring health, you're saying maybe mortality is not the ideal outcome, you know, maybe, maybe it's really bad when doctors disappear for other reasons. Yeah, you have a question behind it? No? Other questions? I like questions. I want to encourage you to ask questions. By the end of the semester, I'm going to have many of you raise your hands. Yeah? Okay, yes? What was your name again? Gianna. Gianna, and you were? Sarija. Sarija. Gianna, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so that's a really good point. So, so what you can imagine is, let's take this as an example. So the discovery by Sinaizai may have taken the fatality rate of tuberculosis from 0.4 to five years later, 0.2. So it may, it may have had the fatality. So that's a big impact. So I don't want you to confuse what I'm saying with the statement that vaccines don't work or are unimportant. Instead, what I want you to see is that much more impact that occurred before that, outside that. So I'm not making the claim that medical care is irrelevant or, or uh, doesn't have an impact. I'm trying to frame for you the magnitude of the effect compared to all the other things that have been happening in our society. So I don't want you to leave this lecture thinking, because we'll come back to this anti the anti-vaxxer movement later on, and, and it's insane, actually, the anti-vaxxer movement is a polite way to put that. Uh, well, actually, I could be more strong, but it's saying it's pretty good. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, so I don't want you to come away thinking, oh, these are superfluous things. We might as well ditch them. I just want you to realize that most of the impact in the last 100 years has not been due to big medicine or modern medical care. Okay. So, um, so thus, the sources of gains in life expectancy during the 20th century can be divided into two broad categories. At the top, we have medical care, or big medicine. Doctors, tests, treatments, the sort of things most of you are already familiar with even before you started taking this class. And the second category of things are socioeconomic change and public health interventions. And this includes things like nutritional improvements, sanitation and prevention improvements, behavioral changes in the population, uh, and, and rising wealth or change in the, in the wealth uh, of the society. And the treatments at the top could include things like antibiotics. But mostly, if you look at the last 100 years, the biggest uh, causal drivers of change in life expectancy and causes of death have not been big medicine, have been socioeconomic change and public health interventions. And Preston, in the reading for today, downplays the role of nutritional improvements in the bottom category, at least in the United States uh, in the 20th century. And he may well be right about that. Now, to be clear, I'm not denigrating the role of science or the important of, importance of medicine in, 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 in how I'm speaking. I don't intend to denigrate either of those things in how I'm speaking to, uh, to you today. Because after all, it was the germ theory of disease which led to strides in uh, improvements in prevention of infectious diseases. So it was a scientific understanding of what caused these infections that resulted in public health changes. So I'm not saying that there's no role for physicians or scientists in making important discoveries. I'm just framing where those discoveries are deployed that have the biggest impact uh, on the health uh, of the public. Um, and plus, I'm a physician myself, so I struggle, as, you'll, as I'll talk to you repeatedly, I struggle with this kind of problem of what is the impact of medicine and how can we frame it and understand it. Clearly, both of these are important, both big medicine and socioeconomic change and public health interventions. But big medicine is not the sole or even the main uh, factor driving the increase in life expectancy. Now, quite independent from the increases in life expectancy, another phenomenon to pay attention to is that these benefits of increasing life expectancy were differentially distributed by socioeconomic status. So the rich got more benefits from the improvements in life expectancy than the poor did over the last 100 years. And so even though everyone was living longer, the gap between the rich and the poor was widening over the last century. 
And this itself, this little thing, this little fact that I just said to you, this little two sentences that summarize this observation, this itself helps provide insight into the source of mortality decline. So here's some uh, results taken from your reading. From the Preston reading, we see mortality rates in children according to father's occupation in 1985, uh, I'm sorry, 1895, 1905, and 1923. And Preston argues that the new hygienic practices associated with the germ theory of disease were more likely to be adopted by the professional classes. And if so, and if they were effective, we would see a widening of social class differences over this period and a change in class vulnerability. And these data illustrate this point. So what Preston does is he looks at the relative child mortality rates by father's occupation in these time periods. Here's a father's occupation, professionals such as physicians, dentists, and veterinarians, and teachers. Then he has farmers and farm laborers, and then he has manufacturing managers, foremen, and laborers. And here, normalized is all children have an, uh, an overall child mortality, and let's say normalized to 100. And what he finds is that physicians and teachers uh, have no different mortality rate in their children than the general rate of mortality. And actually, the people that fare best in, 19, in 1895 are farmers who were relatively wealthy back then. If you lived on a farm, that was an asset. You were a rich person 100 years ago. Or the managers of manufacturing firms. So the, the children of farmers and manufacturers had their lowest mortality rates 100 years ago. And in 1895, the mortality rate of children of doctors and other professionals was no different than anyone else. But incidentally, this indicates fairly clearly that physicians had very few weapons at their disposal to advance survival. If you were doctrinating in 1895 and you knew something that could be useful, clearly you would apply it if your child was sick. Clearly your children, if there was anything that doctors could do, the children of doctors should have had the lowest mortality. But that's not what we see, because in fact there was nothing that doctors really could do to improve the health of anyone, including their children, about 100 years ago. But by 1923, the children of people with knowledge, the professionals, do better. And the children, of, uh, and they have the lowest mortality. So if you fast forward a few years, by 1923, as scientific awareness of sanitation and other practices appears, you find now again normalized to 100, that actually the people whose children have the lowest mortality are those uh, of the professionals. And that actually farmers and managers are still doing well, but not as well as these individuals over there. So the argument that Preston is making is that it's not access to medicine, but access to knowledge that's helping during this period of time. It's when you acquire a knowledge and an understanding of how to prevent illness and are applying that knowledge that you begin to get benefits. Because this time period still includes, or still precedes by a large margin, the introduction of all kinds of effective treatments, as we saw at the beginning of today. And what happens as a result of this, among other things, is a widening gap between the haves and the haves not, have nots uh, in uh, mortality. So if you compare the highest group of 136 among laborers to the lowest group, which is 81 here, that difference might not be as big as comparing 61 uh, to 126. So the worst off group here, the laborers, have twice the mortality rate among their children compared to the teachers and the doctors, whereas here it's not quite twice uh, as large when you compare these two numbers. Maybe 50% or 60% uh, larger. And incidentally, this pattern may be repeating itself today with respect to the adoption of dietary and other practices that reduce mortality from chronic illness as opposed to acute infectious diseases, which is where the action was 100 years ago. Upper socioeconomic status people are often quicker to adopt behavioral practices that reduce mortality from chronic diseases, as we'll see later in the course. Now let's look at how educational differentials in mortality overall are also widening. And this figure is also taken from your reading. And if you look at the middle panel, you'll see the following. So in the middle panel, it shows deaths per 1,000 population. The solid lines are men and the dotted lines are women. And here, let's just look at people that are 65 to 74 years old, OK? So near elderly people. And here, if you look at people with very much education, greater than 12 years, and just a primary education, 0 to 7 years, you see that in 1960, among 65 to 74 year olds, there's not a lot of difference in their death rates. But over the period of time between 1960 to about 15 years later, 71 to 84, you see that actually the death rates on average are declining 
but the gap between the uneducated and the educated widens. It widens. And it widens even though during this period of time between 1960, uh, this is not work, 1960 and 1971, Medicare was introduced in our society. So public health insurance for the elderly is introduced during this period of time. So everyone in this age group has insurance that pays for any medical care that they want by and large. And even so, you see a widening of the gap between the well-educated and the less well-educated in this time period. So this suggests that it is still not big medicine that's driving improvements in healthcare, even in a more recent time period. It suggests that widening class differences uh, uh, and also the broader improvements in health and life expectancy are still being driven more by increasing SES and other uh, non-medical practices in the late 20th century just as much as in the early 20th century. So again, it's not knowledge about, it, it's, it's access to knowledge about prevention that appears to be key. So the general point here, the general intellectual point is that this differentiation amongst socioeconomic groups within our society in the impact of medical care is another hint that what's really driving wellness is not the intervention, but something else. If it were just the intervention, then everyone should get better. But that's not what happens. We see the stratification according to, so far I've just shown you father's occupation and education. We see this divergence in groups that suggest some fundamental role of some socioeconomic factor in explaining what's happening. So it's not just this widget. It's not like I can go out there and I just give you all this medical intervention and you all get better. No, some of you get more better than others. So it's not just the thing that matters. It's some other attribute of the individuals that's crucial in helping to determine whether the health of the public uh, improves. And incidentally, a similar pattern of continuing widening differentials despite a broadening of access to health care was seen in the United Kingdom comparing the time before and after the introduction of the National Health Service in 1948. So 1948 in England, they introduced the NHS. Everyone in the United Kingdom is entitled to this incredible healthcare system. But even so, widening differences. So it's not health care that really matters. Now I'd like to come forward to the second half of the 20th century. Any questions on that? Yeah. Uh, what's your name? I'm sorry? Yomile? Yamile. I'm sorry? Uh, by years of schooling. So you can't really see it. It's in your readings. So this is like 0 to 7 years of schooling, and this is greater than or equal to 12 years of schooling. Was that your question? Yeah. Other questions? So now I'd like to come forward to the second half of the 20th century and examine the two current leading killers, namely cancer and cardiovascular disease. Now first of all, when we want to study uh, whether there have been improvements in our experience of cancer, what do we mean? If we say doctors are doing better at treating cancer now than they used to, what do we mean when we say doing better? What exactly do we mean? And in fact, we could measure a whole bunch of things. We could measure mortality from cancer, are fewer people dying of cancer? after taking into account the aging of the population. Remember, the population's getting older, cancer strikes the old, we see more cancer cases, it doesn't necessarily mean that if we're doing worse, we've got to take into account the aging of the population. It's the opposite of the measles example earlier. Or do we mean that doctors are doing better because there are fewer cases of cancer? Maybe the incidence is going down. Or maybe we mean that conditional on having the cancer, people are living longer after the onset of the cancer. So that's what we mean when we say doctors are doing better. Or maybe we mean none of the foregoing, we just mean that while they have the cancer, the patient's quality of life is better. The doctors are better able to do limb sparing surgery, or they do lumpectomy instead of mastectomy, or they treat the patients, as was mentioned earlier, with less pain, for example. And maybe that's what we mean, the quality of life is better uh, for uh, the patients. And we saw last time, for example, quality of life measures could include limb or voice or breast sparing procedures, palliation, drugs that have fewer side effects, all kinds of things. Now, what to measure and how to measure it is contended by the Baylor and Klausner readings that were assigned for today. Now, Klausner, uh, Baylor is sort of a critic, and Klausner is the head of the National Cancer Institute when they're publishing that work. And the debate is, are we making progress? Is modern medicine helping to make progress in the war on cancer in the United States? 
And what aspects are we making progress on? They're debating. And how should resources be allocated? Given the relative lack or, or uh, availability of progress, how should we spend our money as a society to uh, tackle uh, these problems? And in many ways, figuring out what to measure and how to measure it uh, is half the intellectual and political battle between these two guys uh, that are arguing. Now, these three measures, of course, uh, that they talk about, that Clauser and, and Baylor are arguing about, are, of course, related. So imagine that you have people and they're born. Uh, mortality uh, captures something about the probability of death across time for the whole population. Uh, you can imagine a point in time here in which the condition is uh, incident or is detected, and then this is survival that occurs here. You might, for example, reduce the incidence of disease. That could be an important thing to do. Uh, or you might invent new technologies that improve the detection of the disease. So for example, you might detect more cases, or you might move this point forward and detect it earlier. Now that in and of itself, if you don't postpone death, might falsely make you believe that you're just increasing survival, and all you've done is detected the condition earlier. So you've actually had no impact on mortality from the condition. You've just invented a device that makes you able to detect the condition when it was less severe earlier in the course of the patient's uh, illness. And in fact, Baylor wrote the article that I assigned because he had written a prior article in 1986 uh, for which he said, look, we're making no progress in the war on cancer. And he was heavily criticized for that article. And his critics said back then that important discoveries were just around the corner, like penicillin. Just wait, Dr. Baylor, they said. We're going to be discovering things that treat cancer. Just stand by, they wrote to him when he wrote his first article and that he should wait and see. And they also quibbled with how he could measure success. Well, he waited, uh, and he, a long time, the 20 years or so, and then he published the following article that you were given and showed still no progress. What do his critics say then? Those of you that did the reading, and I hope it's all of you, because if you don't do the reading, you're gonna have a hard time. Yeah? What do his critics say again in the readings that were signed? Wait some more. Wait some more! Exactly, who, who said that, you? Yeah, what was your name? Richard. Richard, yeah, exactly what Richard said. So his critics say, wait some more. Now, poor Dr. Baylor, who I knew, was already in his 70s when I met him uh, in the 1990s at the University of Chicago. He couldn't wait another 20 years uh, to try again. So they said, wait some more. We're just around the corner. We're going to find uh, a penicillin any day now. So what did Baylor argue? Baylor asked, how are we doing when it comes to cancer? In this slide, taken from the readings, shows mortality from all malignant tumors from 1970, through 19, uh, from 1970 to 1994 for the total US population according to race and sex. And the rates have been age adjusted to the US population of 1990. So remember, we already have the intuition that if the population is getting older, you're going to get more cancer deaths in the society. But that's not really a bad thing. It just means people are living to be an older age. So we have to take into account the age structure of the population if we're really going to compare across time how much cancer is there. And you can see that the total mortality for cancer has not changed at all, according to Baylor's uh, statistics. So here you go, from 1970, here's the total mortality. Or maybe it's even increased slightly from 1970 to 19 or almost 2000 uh, of here. So he says, look, we've been fighting this war for all these years. We've made zero progress, uh, Baylor says. And in fact, if you look at these data, you can also see some evidence for widening differentials across time here with respect to race. So actually, among black males, cancer rates have been rising, even taking into account age, whereas the white male uh, have not been going up very much at all. So once again, we see widening differentials across time here without declining overall improvements. Uh, here, according to this, uh, we looked at father's occupation education. Now here's some evidence on race. Now, this issue of, uh, of age adjustment uh, is, a, uh, is something the authors of the two papers are arguing about. And the question is, what's the point of age adjustment? Well, what if you look at the number of deaths per capita in Sweden and Panama with figures such as this? You'd say, OK, here's Sweden. Here's the total number of deaths. Here's the population of Sweden. And we compute the crude mortality rate by dividing this numerator by that denominator. And we see that actually about 1,000 people out of 100,000 die every year in Sweden, and fewer die in Panama, 724 out of 100,000. Would you conclude from this that actually Panama is a healthier society than Sweden? Raise your hands if you think Panama is healthier than Sweden. Raise your hands if you think Sweden is healthier than Panama. 
Okay, what is explains this paradox? Why is not reflected in the mortality statistics? Yeah, what's your name? Emma. Emma, yeah. There are just more old people. Yeah. Uh, the reason the we the reason the reason the Panamanians aren't dying don't have the same force of mortality is they're younger. There are more young people in Panama. That's why the Panamanian statistics artificially look better than the Swedish statistics. So to really go do a head-to-head -head comparison, we'd like to take the age-specific mortality rate. What fraction of five-year-olds die in Panama? What fraction of five-year-olds die in Sweden? What fraction of ten-year-olds die in Panama? What fraction of ten-year-olds die in Sweden? What fraction of 60-year-olds die in Panama? What fraction of 60-year-olds die in Sweden? And we'd like to apply that to a standard population. Let's say there's 10 5-year-olds, 10 10-year-olds, 10 of each age. Multiply those specifically, and then now compare the mortality rates in the two societies. And when you do an exercise like that and do the age adjustment, you see, of course, that Sweden has a lower mortality than Panama. It's healthier uh, than Panama. And this procedure also helps to account for the fact that as we make progress against some diseases, the age structure of the population can change. So for example, a decline in infectious diseases leads to an older population, and we may then wrongly conclude that cancer has become a bigger killer. Whereas it's the same killer as it ever was, it just has more suitable victims now, right? So you've got to age adjust if you're really going to make these comparisons uh, effective. So that's one of the things they're arguing about. So Baylor at some point says to Clauser, well, you want us to age adjust to a medieval age population. Yes, you're right, we're making progress on cancer, but only if we're looking at very young population. So they kind of get snarky with each other in the materials that you were assigned. But updating these data since the baylor Clausner exchange does in fact suggest that there has been a trend beginning in the early 1990s of declining death rates from cancer that has continued to today. So when Baylor, so, so maybe, the, maybe the critics were right, because here's when, uh, 1994, when Baylor publishes his paper, but actually if you look now, you're beginning to see a kind of a dip. So here was the graph, the total cancer from before, now actually maybe it's beginning to go down. But even so, this can hardly be termed a victory in the war against cancer, since at best, we're just finally getting back to where we were in 1950. After all these years, if you look at these rates, we're just getting back to where we were in 1950, despite half a century, more than half a century, of expense and medical advances. And it still doesn't address if it's treatment or prevention that's the most responsible for any decline in population cancer rates. Maybe this decline actually is not because of big medicine. Maybe it's because of preventive medical uh, interventions. And in fact, closer examination of which cancers have declined, as Baylor shows, reveals that the diseases that have declined in the recent period appear to have done so either in response to changes in health habits, lower tobacco consumption, for example, in lung cancer, or improvements in screening practices, for example, for colorectal or breast or prostate cancer. And in fact, this is, after all, the underlying political debate. Do we treat cancer on a case-by-case -case basis, using individual medical care, like chemotherapy, or do we treat cancer on a collective basis using public health interventions, such as screening and health education campaigns? The reason they're arguing is because money is at stake. If Baylor is right, we shouldn't be spending as much money either on research or on treatment using chemotherapy. Actually, we should redeploy resources and change public policy accordingly. Yes, Richard? Can you explain this image? Uh, yes. So on the y-axis is the age-adjusted death rate per 100,000. So what's the, the fraction of people dying after taking into account age changes across time. Uh, and so for example, amongst the total people, this says that 200 people per 100,000 in 1950 are dying of cancer. Cancer mortality is going up across time, and then begins to decline again. And then there's similar lines for men uh, and for women that show the fraction of individuals dying of cancer at each moment in time taking into account the changing age structure of the population. So the argument is the argument that it is not big medicine that is most responsible for any progress we've made in cancer mortality, but rather prevention and public health interventions strikes me as very compelling. Here are some ways to prevent cancer and to truly reduce cancer mortality. We can decrease tobacco use. We can decrease exposure to environmental carcinogens. We can have a change in diet or personal habits that reduce cancer rates. 
uh, and we can employ secondary prevention techniques like uh, pap smears and colonoscopy. And these are actually the things that are driving down the cancer rate, just like we saw with the infectious diseases at the beginning of the class today. Now again, for the example of cancer. It's not chemotherapy, uh, the chemotherapy is not on this list, and that's not what's driving down mortality from cancer. So now let's turn to look, so, so again, that's the, the big uh, the topic for today, is that this doesn't just apply to infectious diseases, this big argument about socioeconomic change and public health interventions. It's not big medicine. It also applies to cancer. And now I'm going to show you that it even applies to cardiovascular disease. So here's what's been happening with cardiovascular diseases of different kinds in our society across the last number of years, sort of roughly plateauing until around 1960. And then you begin to have a decline in total cardiovascular disease shown in the blue line at the top, some other moving around for different kinds of conditions. But the bottom line is this kind of decline uh, for the last 50 or 60 uh, years. Well, what are some explanations for this decline? Well, one possibility, or these are all explanations, one thing that's happening is a decline in tobacco use. People have peaked tobacco use peaks, and we'll come back to this later in the class, uh, a, few, you know, a few decades ago, but has been declining since then. Changes in diet, perhaps related to fat consumption, increases in the proportion of hypertensive people being treated effectively. Part of it may have to do with the fact that among individuals who have high blood pressure, we're treating them effectively. Uh, and maybe another thing is just a decline in blood pressure. Maybe blood pressure is getting better in our whole society. It is. A decline in cholesterol levels. Some of it may have to do with improvements in medical care, especially since the 1970s. For example, in the form of beta blocker drugs, aspirin, heparin, which is a, a blood thinner, thrombolytics, which also means blood thinner, uh, stents, these little tiny, tiny little uh, tubes you can thread through a person's cardiovascular uh, system and open up blocked arteries. Surgery, intensive care units, our emergency medical system may play a role, and so forth. And one really interesting set of ideas is that maybe this decline in cardiovascular mortality may reflect the long-term uh, consequences of a decline in childhood infectious diseases 50 years ago. So one of the ideas is that the reason that older people aren't dying of heart disease as much today as they used to is that fewer older people today were exposed to uh, bacterial pathogens in their youth compared to bygone era. There could be a long-term consequence of you being infected with the bacterium that gives you not only an infection today, but heart disease 50 years from now. So when we treat these infections, we have this long-term uh, benefit. So Cutler, in your readings, estimates that the discovery and use of post-MI, post-myocardial infarction, post-heart attack treatments has contributed about a third of the decline in cardiovascular disease. And that the use of preventive medications, for example, anti-cholesterol or hypertension drugs or anti-diabetic drugs, have also helped and account for about a third of the decline. And that behavior change may explain the remaining third. So in Cutler's estimation, no more than a third of the benefit can be ascribed to big medicine. Most is, again, due to socioeconomic change, behavioral change, and, uh, and preventive uh, interventions. Now, Curiosity about the observed decline in coronary disease prompted a study by the World Health Organization in the 1980s called the Monica Project. And this is a subtle and very important point that I think it's worth paying attention to. This was a 10-year study of trends in cardiac disease and risk factors in 38 populations in 21 countries around the world, from China to Spain to the United States and so forth. And one of the key questions in the study was this. Could any declines in blood pressure noted over the 10-year period be attributed to its treatment or to some other factors? So blood pressure had been declining. They said, let's monitor blood pressure around the world for the next 10 years and ask ourselves, A, is blood pressure in the general public declining? And B, is the reason for its decline that we're using more drugs to reduce blood pressure? Two questions. And there were several insights in the data that suggested that the decline in blood pressure could not be attributed to big medicine, could not be attributed to the wider use of more effective medications. And so the, one of the ways, one of the very subtle hints in the data about this was the following. They asked themselves, was there a decline in blood pressure only in certain parts of the distribution, i.e. in the high readings only, or across the entire distribution with similar falls in the bottom, middle, and top of the distribution. And since people at the bottom of the blood pressure distribution are not being given any medication, uh, if declines are seen across the whole distribution, 
it would suggest that it's something other than big medicine, other than the treatment of people at the top that's driving the change. So for example, let's say you looked at blood pressure at one point in time in blue, and then you came back and you looked at it at another point in time later on in red, after which perhaps you had been treating the people with high blood pressure and reducing the number of people with high blood pressure. Do you understand so far? What that should do is cause a deformation in the curve, but no shift to the left. Perhaps no change in mean, or in any case, certainly no movement here, because none of those people are being given the blood pressure medication. But if you see that the curve shifts entirely to the left, it means something else is happening. It's not the medic medicines that are being invented and deployed by doctors that's happening. Some other change in our society may be driving the blood pressure down in the whole population. So one way to understand that is to imagine that there are two things that could happen to this distribution. You could either remove these people from these cells by treating them so their blood pressure goes away, but of course those people don't disappear. They just get added to these cells, right? Their blood pressure gets reduced. They move up, they deform the distribution. Or you could just move everyone down a notch. And this pattern is consistent with better treatment, and this pattern is consistent with some other kind of secular change in the society. So the question is, what is it? What happens when you look at blood pressure distributions in populations across time in advanced societies? And the answer is secular change. Third example, where it's not big medicine that's driving. So this looks at the distribution uh, in 50-year-old women in Denmark during the period from 1964 to 1991. And what you find is, is in 1964, the curve is here. By 1978, it's been shifted to the left, but smoothly. 1991, shifted to the left again. And each period of time, it gets shifted over across the whole distribution. So people in Denmark are getting better. And they were getting better even before we invented these drugs. And they're getting better despite any use of these drugs when it comes to hypertension. So the point here again is that even for cardiovascular disease, uh, the same pattern that we've been discussing uh, obtains. Number one, that the changes are seen before the discovery of manifestly efficacious big medicine. And number two, that to the extent that these changes can be parsed, most of the improvements arise not because of big medicine, but because of public health interventions and socioeconomic change. Yeah, what's your name? Sukriti. Sukriti. Well, I mean, you have to apply a number of statistical tests to really uh, zero in on the, but there's not much deformity. So if you look here, you might see a little bit in this curve. You see this curve right here? See how it's not such a smooth movement for this period of time? I can't make out what it is. But mostly, these are unsmoothed. You know, these are bent uh, curves for large samples, and they just shift to the left. So there may be some role. But again, my point in today is not to suggest that medical interventions play no role. My point today is to disabuse you of any fantasy you have that that's the big driver of life expectancy improvements in our society in the last years. It's not. The big drivers are other changes. So I'm not saying medicine has no role. I'm just saying it's a small role compared to these other things. Other questions? And just to really punch this point home, this intellectual point home, uh, that not every secular trend in human biology must be due to the use of medication. So if we see biology changing, it doesn't necessarily have to do with medication. Consider, for example, this uh, data about menarche, which is the age of onset of the first menstrual period in women. Uh, this type of age of menarche has also shown a secular change over the last 200 years. So we have very good data from the Scandinavian countries uh, regarding the year, uh, uh, regarding the average age of menarche uh, according to year. So if you look at Norway, going back 150 years, Norwegian girls, the median age in menarche was about 17 and a half 100 years ago. But in Norway, you see that the average girls now, or at least in 19, uh, whatever it is, 1950, average age in menarche was about 14. Who knows the average age in menarche in the United States today? Raise your hands if you know. Median age, 50% of girls get their first period by what age? Raise your hands if you think it's 10. Raise your hands if you think it's 11. 12, 13, 14, 15, yeah, it's around 11 or 12. Actually, I think it's 11 and a half. I think someone can correct me. 50% of girls get their period before they're in sixth grade, guys. I mean, it's just unbelievable a change that's happened in the last 100 years. And this is not because we're medicating the girls, right? We're not giving them pills to make them get their periods earlier. 
So some other thing is changing in our society, which results in this dramatic change in a very fundamental aspect of human physiology, which has nothing to do with big medicine, right? Some people think it's the hormones in the milk. There are lots of explanations, but we may come to that later in the class. And the same kind of pattern is seen uh, in many industrialized societies around the world. So the balance of prevention and therapy always needs to be assessed. And it's a politically, and it can be politically contentious, as we saw in the Baylor and Klausner exchange. Now, according to Cutler from the readings, he says, well, what are the relative benefits of treatment versus prevention? And he says, the typical adult will require $30,000 be spent on cardiovascular disease treatment over his or her lifetime, but gains about $120,000 in net present value to the increased longevity. So the return on investment from spending money on treatment is about four. But the typical adult will require that $1,000 be spent on cardiovascular behavior change and prevention, but actually gains as a result of that between seven dollars and $30,000 in net present value. So the ROI from prevention can be as much as eight times higher. You gain a lot more from treatment, uh, from prevention than from treatment, right? An ounce of treatment, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And this issue of prevention versus treatment will be another recurrent theme in the class. Now I'm going to close with a couple of remarks, uh, just sort of framing this issue yet again, and then we'll begin to our teeth into specific topics uh, over the coming uh, uh, semester. Because all of these changes in disease incidence, whatever their cause, are not going to make us immortal. So we started by looking at, OK, what happened at the beginning of life, this unprecedented once in a lifetime, once in history opportunity to stop childhood mortality, which we've done in our rich countries. Well, what about the other end of the world? What about at the top? You know, what kind of constraints does that uh, place on us? Because these observations about, uh, about increasing life expectancy are not going to cul culminate in our immortality. It's not like suddenly we've been rendered immortal or that with continued intervention, we will become immortal. But they do raise questions about what is the upper limit of human longevity. What if current trends continue? How long might we live? And here's some estimates of maximum life expectancy based on various populations. So for example, if you look at the US population in 1986, the life expectancy is right around there. Here's Japan in 1988, a very long-lived population. Mormon high priests are an exceptionally long-lived population. So if you look at Mormon high priests, you can get really good insights into what might be the maximum life that someone could have. And here's a model that Manton produces in this, in this manuscript that says, if we did every single thing right, everything known to human beings that can advance your life expectancy, what's our estimate about your maximum life? Uh, and it's about 100 years, he concludes. So another way to think about this is as following. Imagine that you could divide all causes of death into two categories, intrinsic and extrinsic. And intrinsic causes of death arise from failure of biological processes, like cellular apoptosis, that originate within an organism. So something inside you that causes you to die. And extrinsic causes are things outside you that cause you to die. Uh, and that are primarily imposed on the organism by outside forces like pathogens or accidents or predators or other kinds of things. So consider a hypothetical experiment in which animals are maintained in an optimal environment where they're completely protected from infectious diseases, from aggression, and from accidents. And when all deaths arise from external forces, uh, are all, and all deaths arising from external forces have been eliminated. Every animal in this population would theoretically achieve their lifespan potential and succumb only to intrinsic causes of death. People have done experiments like that with certain small mammals to see what happens if you remove all the intrinsic causes. Does the animal become immortal? No, it does not. Well, what's its natural lifespan from, uh, from the intrinsic causes? So if we eliminated all the extrinsic causes, would we live forever or at least for a very long time? And could we also, if we wanted, uh, make progress against some of the intrinsic causes. So maybe we can invent new technologies, so nanotechnologies or gene therapy or cyborg technologies, which we'll also discuss at the end of the class. Maybe there's new things that are about to happen, like penicillin right around the corner uh, that's going to make us uh, sort of immortal. It's going to make us live for a very long time. And this, is a result, and this has resulted in a debate amongst various kinds of scientists. 
And when scientists have this kind of debate, sometimes they, um, they do experiments, but sometimes they just they make a bet. And there's a long and rich tradition in the sciences of bets, scientific bets, about different kinds of things. For example, famously Alfred Russell Wallace, the famous naturalist, bet John Hampton in 1870 that the Earth was not flat. Hampton says the Earth is flat. Wallace says, put your money where your mouth is. They make a bet on this topic and describe a procedure by which they will decide whether the Earth is flat or not. And in 2005, there was a bet that is relevant to what we've been discussing today, here, uh, what we've been discussing here today, namely whether people could not live to be 150. And it relates to the intrinsic versus extrinsic mortality and the upper limit of human lifespan. If we, were, if we progressively stop all extrinsic causes, if we progressively stop accidents and cure all diseases, will we simply become immortal or are we pre-programmed to die at some point? And what is that point? And on the two sides of the bet are the following figures. J. L. Shansky, who's a demographer at the University of Illinois, and Stephen Alstad, who's a zoologist uh, at the University of Idaho. And they made a bet for a half a trillion dollars. Uh, and uh, Olshansky says 130 is the top end of human lifespan. And Alstead says, no, you're wrong. There's a person alive today who will live to be 150. And so, um, and, uh, and so what they agreed to do is they each agreed to put a little bit of money into a bank account, to make contributions every year, and to bind their heirs to make contributions for the next 150 <laughs> years. And all this money would be accumulated in a bank account at Chase for 150 years. And 150 years from now, uh, they, they decided that, uh, that uh, and I'm sorry, so they, they each put in, uh, uh, in, 2000, in 2005, they each put in $150, and they agreed that they would make annual contributions and their heirs would for 150 years. And they agreed that the person, in order to decide this bet, 150 years from now, the 150-year-old must have been alert throughout his entire life, and the outcome should be judged on January 1st, 2150, by three scientists chosen by the president of the American Academy for the Advancement of Science, relying on three standard forms of identification, such as a birth, marriage, or death certificate, but they also agreed to defer to the scientific expertise and methods of the future to determine the outcome. So they said, okay, those guys are gonna decide. Now it's interesting to note what's not a part of this bet, and that is whether everyone will have the opportunity to live to be 150 or not. Maybe once again, there'll be widening differentials over the next 150 years. Because to me, it seems, it seems unavoidable that a rising tide will not lift all boats, but only some at the top of the SES scale. Some boats will be lifted more than others. Maybe not everyone will have access to these improvements, whatever they might be, and whatever their extent. That's today. Any questions? Yeah. Yes. So there, we believe that there are certain things that inside you that pre we know. There are certain genes that predispose you to getting cancer. And we also know that there are toxins and, and pathogens and others which combine to give you uh, cancer. That's right. Does anyone know, by the way, why we're not immortal? What's the deep explanation? This is a very <coughs> interesting hard question. Why hasn't an organism evolved on the planet to be immortal? Yeah? Uh, the chromosomes in each of the cells shorten with time. Because yeah, every time they reproduce, there's a centromere, which gets shorter. But that's, that's an explanation for why. But that maybe why didn't an organism evolve some other way of reproducing or some kind of way of fixing the centromere, just like we do across time? Why aren't we immortal? Yeah? There'd be no incentive to reproduce if you're going to live forever. Say that again? Okay, that's a, you're almost there. That's a bit tautological, though. What you're saying is reproduction is so great that we don't want to go without it. So what? Why, so why, why is the incentive to reproduce so important that it, you know, that if that comes primary? Yeah. Other ideas? Are you more and more likely to encounter the infection? Yes. So the deepest explanation for why we're not immortal. This is mind blowing to me. The deepest explanation is that there are always extrinsic causes of death. You can be a perfect organism. No intrinsic cause of death. You're immortal. And you're going about the business and a tree kills you. What a waste of evolutionary effort to perfect such an organism because a falling tree makes you die. So across evolution, what's happened is, is we've reached a balance. The existence of extrinsic causes of death is what gives us intrinsic causes of death. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, there was some other question here. 
Yeah? yeah? I'm sorry, what's your name? Stand by. I'll lead you out in a minute. Yeah? Leah. Leah? Can you just explain again how the age of justice does that longitude? No, so the, the, the way it's done, and you can look it up, but the way it's done mechanistically is we say, we're going to create an artificial population where of 100 people, and we've got 10 people in each decade of life in this population. Now that's different than over here, we've got 80 people that are under than 40 and 20 that are older than 40, and here we've got 20 people that are younger than 40 and 80. Those are crazy different populations. One's old, one's young. Here we create a standard population. And then in this society, we compute what is the uh, probability of death in each age group, and take that probability and multiply it times the number here. And we take the probability of this population and multiply it here and compare in the standard population. That's how it works. Other questions? See you next time.